Alright, hi guys, welcome back to this video of me making an audio book from a book that I'm reading called Diet Wise. This is the second video and today I'll be starting from page 8. And here we go, this is called Case Book 1. Think all this is historic, beyond our era, and irrelevant? Maybe it sounds too extreme. Do you have to be so strict to live a hundred years? Certainly not. Let me tell you a story from my case book. Arthur was in his 60s when he first made contact with me. His health had deteriorated to a point where he was lying in bed over 20 hours a day, with scarcely strength to move. His heart was weak and enlarged, and he had been waiting for a suitable donor to come along to provide a transplant. Having heard about me and some of the sensational cures that I have been getting by just excluding certain toxic foods, he asked me for help. I put him on exactly the same recommended diet program described here in this book. Within two weeks, he was starting to feel better. Within a month, he was not only able to travel, but actually drove himself to my office. By the time we had completed testing for food culprits, it became clear that wheat was his number one enemy. When he tried to reintroduce it as described on page 126, he collapsed into his earlier debentilated condition. Arthur's ideal diet required him to avoid wheat and one or two lesser banded foods which he did dutifully. His health recovered to a state where he was fitter than men 10 years his junior. He never had the heart transplant and will never need one, I'm sure. The last time I visited him, before I left UK for good, I saw Arthur in his home. At the age of 78, he had been erecting a huge wooden shed single-handedly he had cut the timbers drilled and fixed them and even put on a roof which required lifting and considerable weight above his head height this determined man wanted a small workshop and had decided to build his own next part Diet may be the key to aiding recovery. Today, fortunately, there is a growing awareness that correct eating and good health go hand in hand. With the discovery of the phenomenon of food allergies and genetic food intolerance, and the recognition of their widespread harmful effects, it has been estimated that over half of all illnesses reported to doctors are caused or worsened by toxic food. So this condition is not rare. I will share with you cases that suffered from apparently incurable diseases, which nevertheless got well following the path I lay out in this book. Afflictions such as brain damage, heart enlargement, infertility may seem to have nothing to do with what a person eats, yet the patients improved dramatically. Doing what I shall be telling you in this book, how can this happen? The important principle is what we call total body load. If you can reduce the body's problems significantly, nature can often take care of the rest and work and apparently spontaneous healing. In addition to major name diseases, there is a great deal of minor symptomatology which is not reported at all. Everyone considers it normal to have a few aches and pains. Good health is often taken to be the mere absence of disease, yet abundant energy well-being, clarity of thinking, and this should be your lot. If this isn't the case, 
then the advice in this book probably applies to you. Unfortunately, the medical profession as a whole is entrenched in the belief that diet is unimportant, despite the fact that Hippocrates over 2,000 years ago stated that no healing could be truly successful without attention being paid to what the patient was eating. Instead, the conventional doctors blunders on with newer and more dangerous drugs, always ready with the scalpel or chemo spurred on by more and more obscure laboratory investigations until the patient is lost in the water of science. One wonders where it will all end. For where else, in other professions, a narrowness of view is nothing more than just an infantile and becoming failure. In medicine, it is dangerous neglect of duty from which only the patient suffers. A doctor has a certain responsibility to do the best for his or her patient and that means keeping abreast of any area of new knowledge which may help. Okay, now let's continue to chapter 2. How can you have a hidden allergy or a food incompatibility? It is unusual to think of food allergy in terms of the type of illness which results from an allergy to nuts, strawberries, or shellfish. These food, however, are not eaten on a day-by-day -day basis. And the violence of the reaction when encountered leaves little opportunity for the source of the illness to remain unsuspected. But there's an entirely different clinical picture when the food to which you are allergic is the staple item to your diet that you can eat every day of your life, perhaps several times each day. Under these circumstances, the body adapts to the allergic process and reactions disappears to become a mask allergy. This adaption of the body may last a lifetime or may become exhausted at any time under stress. When the adaption by the body is complete, there are no symptoms, but if the strain of coping with the allergy wears down, the addictive process, then a whole variety of symptoms may break the surface. At different times in a person's life, these breaks through manifestations of the underlying mask allergy may present themselves as a wide variety of illnesses. Let us take a typical life story of a person who is allergic to cow's milk. If born fat as a baby, there are considerable feeding difficulties. Baby gets a lot of wind and mother gets many sleepless nights. There may be a long period with a runny nose maybe ear troubles, sore throats, constant colds or tonsils and donuts get removed. The adaptive process may become complete from time to time and all symptoms may disappear. The allergic patient may enjoy periods of excellent health when nothing appears to be wrong. But it is quite usual for the patient to have growing pains, to be over or underactive, showing signs of attention disfliction disorder, also known as ADD, suffering troublesome headaches and being highly susceptible to infections with consequent frequent colds and flu-like attacks. At puberty, the patient's story may take a dramatic turn. All symptoms may disappear completely or everything may get worse. When puberty brings trouble, it can come in many different forms. Migraine, eczema, eczema, acne, depression, and behavior problems. Even vandalism can suddenly turn on as a result of a mask allergy, becoming partially unmasked. In girls, 
all manner of menstrual problems may be a result of an unsuspected allergy in foods or chemicals. It seems as though the body becomes super sensitive to its own hormones and any variation in the hormone balance occurring at puberty, at menstruation, during pregnancy, or at the menopause may all cause symptoms of varying degrees. These symptoms may be premenstrual tension, heavy painful periods, abstinence periods, sickness in pregnancy, toxemia of pregnancy, depression after confinement, and all those unpleasant symptoms commonly associated with a change of life. Alright, this last sentence here actually I could really relate to just recently this year. The whole of 2018, I have completely cut out on a lot of snacks that I like. I, I have been cutting down over the years since uh, 2015, I would say. I've been cutting down a lot of uh, snacks that I like, like potato chips and fried, uh, deep fried fries. So this year, I've been even more <laughs> obedient, I would say. I have uh, been trying to be really eating clean. I've been eating real, real, only real food, no processed food. So, no sausages that are processed and frozen. Um, no fake crab steaks, none of those. Less fish balls, I would say. Um, it's a bit difficult, I guess, if you're in Singapore, because when you're in Singapore, you tend to eat fish balls a lot. It's like a, it comes with young tau fu or fish ball noodles, you know. So yeah, ever since I'm, I'm cutting out all these and eating real, real food and um, more vegetables, of course. Uh, if uh, uh, you know me or my close friends know me, that I've been an on and off vegan, vegetarian, and pescetarian over the past few years. So I've been really testing out many kind of diets to see what it does to my body. And I would say vegan diet is not recommended because um, you have to be smart to know where to get your vitamins from. And for a vegetarian diet, um, it is also very important to know how you get your sauce from, is your sauce um, well digested. So those are all very important parts. And now i am finally led myself in the pescetarian diet for the whole of 2018. Um, ever since I came back from Italy, I've been having trouble looking for food back home because uh, the food in Italy and here is different. So. I am a big fan of Mediterranean food and also Indian food but local food here is quite unhealthy I would say. I found that being pescetarian has been great for me so far. I have less acne problems by cutting out meat. I do still eat a bit of chicken, pork, not beef at all really unless it's a special occasion. Yep. But if my grandma does a chicken or a pork, I will eat just a bit, but most of the time I will have fish and vegetables and fruits, yeah, and my normal um, hazelnut milk, almond milk, which I've been taking since uh, 2014 because um, I don't like how milk makes me feel. It makes me feel bloated full and then like I can't eat any more things after I have a cup of milk like I'm completely full I could be full for like two three hours straight and not have anything it feels uncomfortable anyway for milk I will have a chapter for it and um, I have a lot to say about it a lot about how the world have made us 
nothing how milk is and that's not how milk should be. Yep, so I should stop bubbling about this right now and I'll see you guys in the next uh, audio. Thank you for listening and I'll catch up with you again. Ciao, ciao.